Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm Lauren Kravitz with the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. Um, we are very pleased to have a great group assembled today to talk about DERS and how we can move forward to improve it. Um, I think we can be a little more specific than that. As we said in the public notice announcing the workshop, specifically what we'd like to do today is discuss the value of the information that we uh, currently receive in DERS. Um, we would like to discuss ways to increase the voluntary participation because as you know DERS is a voluntary program. John's going to talk more about that in a minute. Uh, we want to talk about extending DERS to obtain more detailed data about the effects of a disaster on broadband communication services. Uh, we want to talk about adding information from over-the-top voice and video service providers and also what if any additional information from DERS participants might be beneficial to the restoration process. Um, I think there's no better way to start than to ask John Healy, the Bureau's Chief Statistician and the Assistant Division Chief in our Cybersecurity and Communications Reliability Division, um, to uh, give an overview of DERS. John is one of the creators of DERS and um, leads our effort to analyze information we receive in DERS. So I'm going to turn it over to John, who is going to tell us about... Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lauren. I'm waiting for my, my slides to come up, start coming up. The disaster information reporting system was actually started about four or five years ago. It was started in response to Hurricane Katrina. During Hurricane Katrina, what, what we found out was is we were not collecting information consistently. We were asking companies on an individual basis for information about what was happening during the hurricane and we were getting relatively disparate responses from the various companies. We couldn't put the information together in a good way and we weren't able to analyze the information and provide uh, a detailed uh, combination or summary of the information to FEMA or to other government agencies. As a result of all this, we decided to form or to, to develop the disaster information reporting system. Let me move on to my next slide. There's two organizations that, that really developed DERS. Um, NCS, the National Communication Systems, worked with the FCC in developing DERS. We also worked very closely with the Network Reliability Steering Committee and a, a number of their members to develop a lot of the requirements for DERS and to improve DERS. What is DERS? Well, the Disaster Information Reporting System is a web-based system which collects information on network status during disasters. But probably the more important portion of DERS is that it uh, tracks restoration. We collect information on a daily basis during in, in DERS, and when you collect it on a daily basis, you can see how things are being restored. Um, and in, in fact, the main difference between NORS, the Network Outage Reporting System, and the Disaster Information Reporting System is the fact that DERS is really aimed at tracking restoration. Um, I mentioned earlier that DERS provides consistent data. That's the goal of having um, a, a system in place. We wanted to make sure that we collected the same type of information from each industry segment. And we tried to make sure that the, the, the information across industry segments was similar. So what information is input into DERS? Uh, we, we get contact information from the various companies. We also get information on network status, on switches, on cell sites by county, uh, broadcast stations, that's AM, FM, and TV stations. We get information on cable systems. I used to call it CATV, but we're going to be hopefully changing that over, over the course of the, the next year. We also get information on PSAPs, the status of PSAPs. Now, the output of DERS is a set of tables that go to NCS, a set of maps, and a set of charts. And a couple examples are just shown here. So let me move on to my next slide. What do we get from DERS? 
And this is an example of what we got from DERS during Hurricane Irene. During Hurricane Irene, cell site restoration was incredibly fast. It was much faster than, than anything we've seen before. Typically what we saw in, in Hurricane Gustav and Hurricane Ike was about a 15% restoration rate on cell sites. During Hurricane Irene, during uh, two consecutive days, we saw about 40% of the cell sites restored. Uh, again, this was remarkably fast. In addition, during Hurricane Irene, about 60% of the cell sites that were out were out because of transport problems. Mm -hmm. um, basically, you couldn't get the signal from the cell site to the mobile switching center. Um, some of that was because of down bridges, uh, washed out fiber, all kinds of things. But the fact is, this was much greater than we had seen like during Hurricane Gustav and Hurricane Ike, where only about 40% of the reason uh, was because of transport problems. During Hurricane Irene, we didn't see any major switch out. No major um, uh, mobile switching center was out. So it didn't affect large pieces of equipment. There were switches out, there were um, smaller pieces of equipment out, but n no large switch or mobile switching center. I honestly do, do not know if there was a, a large router out because we don't collect that information currently in DERS. There was no PSAP that was completely out of service. Uh, there were a number of PSAPs that were rerouted. 18 of them were rerouted. Um, when I say uh, no PSAP was completely out of service, what I mean is that the, if you dialed 911, there was a very good chance that y your call would complete to a uh, 911 center. The maximum number of radio stations that were out were, were 10. Basically, Hurricane Irene affected a large area, but did not devastate any area very, very much. <laughs> Let me move on to my next, okay. The uh, one thing that we implemented in, in DERS over the last year was w we have a button or uh, a line in DERS on a number of their main pages where companies in, in critical need of help can click on it and provide a request for help. Uh, this is an example, um, WVXR in Vermont, they needed a generator. They sent out a request through DERS. We, we got the request, we, we forwarded the request to FEMA and I think we forwarded it to NCS I think it's automatically sent to you guys. Um, what ended up happening was that the, uh, um, they were actually very happy with the response that, that uh, they got. This is a, uh, an email that we got back from them. Thanks for the reply. I'm very impressed how well the DERS reporting and coordination system is working. This lo looks like a great resource. To the extent that we have equipment or resources around the state which might be of use to others, it is good to know that there is this kind of response in Clearinghouse for Information. So uh, we helped out in a couple stations, a couple ca small carriers. Um, so, so DERS is being used uh, a actually to, to aid in the restoration process. Let me show you uh, some, of the some of the other results of DERS or that we got through DERS. This is a chart that shows the restoration during Hurricane Irene. Remember I said there was a 40% improvement in the cell site? Uh, this is it by state. You can see Connecticut, Maryland, all the way across to Vermont. And um, the y-axis is the percent of cell sites that were out in the disaster area. One thing about Hurricane Irene, we had a huge disaster area. There were 171 counties in 13 states that were in the disaster area. This is the largest uh, geographic area that we ever had DERS activated for. What you can see, uh, there's a green and uh, it looks like a, I, 
I don't know what these colors are, by the way. I, the second color, the color for uh, August 30th, is, looks to me like a sort of a, a reddish brown, and then there's like sort of a pinkish red. Uh, what you can see is that the restoration rate was, re was remarkable, actually, uh, for cell sites going from August 29th through August 31st. In virtually every state, there was about a 40% reduction in, in cell sites out of service. Vermont was, was the most, was, was the largest, so it was, like I said, it was incredible. Uh, let me move on to my next slide. This is a map from Hurricane Irene. Um, what this, we generate maps for cell sites out of service, for switches out of service, for uh, the number of customers out of service, for um, broadcast stations, um, for cable systems. We, we generate a whole slew of different maps. This is just one example. Um, this is just for Virginia, and it's just for one day. And what you can see is the effect of Hurricane Irene on that day. And you can see that it was mo more the internal counties that had a uh, large percentage of, of cell sites out of service. Um, and a number of the counties up north didn't seem to have very many, many counties out of service. During Hurricane Irene, Virginia w actually was the state that was most affected. Uh, and it was the one that in which the restoration efforts uh, were actually kind of the slowest. It was, uh, Virginia seemed to be really impacted. Uh, South Carolina wasn't impacted much at all. North Carolina was impacted a fair amount. And uh, Virginia was impa impacted quite a bit. As the storm moved up, there were a number of states that were also impacted a fair amount. Uh, Vermont was, uh, Connecticut, and uh, actually Rhode Island it was impacted a, a fair amount by the storm. So this is just an example of one of the maps that we generated uh, for Hurricane Irene. Here's an, uh, another example map. And this is a map of uh, switches down or at risk. I'm not showing you one for Hurricane Irene because there really wasn't much down in terms of switches. And there were, there were some that were on backup power, but it really didn't affect a lot of switches. Um, this is a map that was modified from Hurricane Ike. And the red dots indicate things that are down, and they're coded by the type of switch. The green are things that are on generator, and the the uh, blue are the, th the ones that are on battery. So you, you can see in this particular chart that the, uh, uh, you can almost see where the storm actually hit and which, which areas were uh, in most in trouble. So this is another example of a map that we provide uh, for, for, uh, for hurricanes and for disasters. So let me move on to who makes DERS work. I also, I, I had already mentioned that NCS and the NRSC make DERS work. Um, I'd like to also mention that there's a number of associations that have reached out to their members for every hurricane and every disaster that we activated DERS for. They've been our point of contact for m many of their members. Uh, NAB is an example, NCTA. Uh, they reach out to their members and we truly appreciate it. There's also a number of FCC bureaus who, uh, if we don't get information from uh, various uh, broadcasters or small carriers or whatever, um, they reach out to them and we try to uh, get them into the DERS fold. The Media Bureau, the Wireline Competition Bureau, the, the uh, Wireless Telecommunication Bureau. We also get, uh, we reach out to the satellite providers, although we don't put the information directly into DERS. Uh, through the International Bureau. But there's one group that we really have to thank uh, for providing information into DERS, and it's the, the carriers and the companies, the wireline carriers, the wireless carriers, the broadcasters. 
the cable system providers. These are the people who really make DERS work. If these companies did not provide the information directly into DERS, DERS wouldn't, would be a complete failure. So we, we truly thank the companies who provide us information directly into DERS. Um, there's some companies who have been incredibly good, and I probably sh can't mention these, <laughs> their names, but they know who's been really good. Okay, so what is missing from DERS? Well, there's a, a fair amount of information that's missing from DERS, but it's most, it, it actually generally falls in the broadband area. So we don't collect a, a, any information on, uh, from cable systems on the number of VoIP customers out of service. We have no breakdown from, from the uh, cable system. In fact, the way the form read for Hurricane Irene, we asked them f pretty much for the number of cable TV customers that were out of service. So we currently don't collect information for cable systems on, on the VoIP customers out of service, nor on the broadband access customers out of service. Now, a number of, uh, we, we got calls from the eighth floor asking us, well, how many broadband users are out of service? And all we could tell them is, we don't know. And uh, it's, it's kind of, and for, for me, it's a little embarrassing to tell the chairman that I don't know. Uh, and that we don't collect that kind of information. And that's another, that's a reason why uh, we're here today is to talk about some of this. For wireline broadband, we don't collect, we actually do not collect this information currently. We don't collect the number of VoIP customers out of service. We don't collect the number of broadband access users out of service. We don't collect how many of their TV subscribers are out of service. So we don't collect any of that kind of information. Now you might say, well, again, why is this important? Well, w when EAS alerts are sent out, uh, you'd like to have some idea who, who doesn't get them or who doesn't get them through their cable systems, through their cable TV systems, for example. We also don't get any information from uh, over-the-top VoIP and video providers. So we have no idea whether th those that group of people um, uh, are essentially off the air, can't get any communications. So that, that's what's missing. So why is it important? Well, what we'd like to do, again, is to close this gap. Um, we'd like to follow a, you know, a voluntary approach we believe this voluntary approach that we have for DERS has worked. But the reason why, again, it's important is, is that right now, about 22 million subscribers from cable companies uh, get, get their voice telephone service through, the, through cable companies. Right now, about 80 million broadband users, uh, um, so there are about 80 million broadband users, and we don't have any information on any of that in DERS. So we, uh, we honestly believe that we're missing a large portion of the communications industry uh, right now in DERS because we don't collect any information on whether uh, various types of broadband services are out of service. I'd like to close by just saying that DERS, I believe DERS has worked quite effectively in providing information to NCS, to FEMA, on Hurricane Irene. I believe that there's some holes in it, and that's what we're here to address, some of the holes in DERS. I think, I personally believe the voluntary approach has actually worked quite effectively. Um, companies have provided all kinds of information into DERS. I think it's because companies and virtually everybody wants to to be part of the disaster recovery effort. They want to say that uh, my company, my organization is supporting um, the, the country in, in recovering from a disaster. 
and I believe DERS, DERS is a, an important tool in the communications industry uh, in, in supporting recovery from disasters. So let me um, turn it over now back to Lauren. Um, if, if people have any questions for me, well, you probably, uh, you probably don't have any questions now, but okay. Sure. Yes. Um, maybe I should have, uh, um, actually Glenn is not here, so. The I'm sorry, uh, the, the question was is what is the uh, an over the top uh, VoIP or uh, basically it's like Vonage. Uh, I mean, what, what Vonage does is, is th they're a good example of that, so. Okay. I'm sorry, yeah. You should, you, by the way, I'm sure that the distinguished panel will answer your questions much better than me. Uh, I'm Barbara Esben with Cinnamon Mueller, and we represent ACA, the um, Independent Cable Operator Trade Association. I, I have one question. Uh, as I was listening to you, it occurred to me, if you have um, cable companies reporting, for example, that their video uh, customers are out, is it not possible to extrapolate that their system is down and it would also affect the other services provided over those facilities? Uh, the answer is yes, but we don't generally know the, uh, how many customers are in each of those categories. Yes. The answer is yes, uh, but a lot of times uh, with, with different companies, they have uh, a large number of customers that have one type of service and they may have um, uh, much fewer customers with one of the other types of services. And what, what we need to get is a kind of a com an idea of, uh, for the major types of services, a breakdown of how many people are really out of service. Yes, the answer is you are absolutely right. Usually if, if, if a cable head end is down, it affects all the services, yes. Okay, let me turn it over to Lauren. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, John. Um, what I would like to do is ask our roundtable participants to introduce themselves. And um, first, I want to point out that we have Julie Lazat from SRT Communications in Minot, South Dakota, on the interactive conference bridge. Am I right, Julie? Yes, that's correct, but I'm actually from North Dakota. Oh, that's South Dakota. Okay, <laughs> apologies, but uh, we know you're there, and yes. if you have something that you'd like to say, um, I don't know how you raise your hand, but um, please chime in. Okay. Um, well, actually, you know, we just had this disaster come through Minot with uh, the flooding of the Mouse River, and um, I've never really entered anything into DERS. My main obligation was to get everything into the outage, outage reporting. So it's, it's interesting to know that this tool is out there, and I think it is an important tool, and it will be a good resource for me to use in the future. Okay. Thank you. We hope that you'll um, uh, chime in later on. Okay. Thank and you. Um, why don't we start with introducing, we'll let everybody introduce themselves, and we'll start with Jim. Uh, Jim Bugell with AT&T. AT and, and you know what? I'm going to remind everyone that... Um, in order for the closed captioning to pick up what you're saying and the people listening on the webcast, you have to speak into the mic. So in order to make that work, you might want to give a signal to the guys in the AV room um, when you're going to talk. <laughs> I'll try to remember. Thank you. Jim Bugell with AT&T. Stacy Hartman with CenturyLink. Kate Dean with the U.S. ISP Association. Charlie Hoffman with uh, FEMA Disaster Emergency Communications. Good morning. John O'Connor with the National Communications System. Mark Pay with Cox Communications. John Sambo, Time Warner Cable. Andy Scott with the National Cable and Telecommunications Association. Larry Walk with National Association of Broadcasters. I'm John Healy, but I'm really not on the panel. I'm just here to answer questions if, if, if they come up. 
Thank you. Um, we really do want to have an interactive roundtable format. As you see, we do have a wireless mic in the room, so if someone who's not on the panel wants to add some content or ask a question, um, please signal and we'll get the mic over to you. Um, let's launch into our first discussion question, which is, um, as you know, we recently had an activation of DERS for Hurricane Irene, so I'm going to ask the roundtable participants to discuss what they thought worked well in that process. We don't have to go in any particular order. A AT and T, so <clears throat> go first. Um, having been involved uh, with uh, doers post Katrina, even during Katrina, uh, as John said, uh, it was a it was a haphazard um, uh, process to try to get uh, the FCC and and and. NCS and and even the White House situational awareness about the extent uh, of the um, of the damage created by by Katrina um, and having gone through many versions of uh, of activations uh, many activations of doers I think this was the best cycle um, this is the best cycle we've ever had um, I think that uh, uh, as far as uh, as far as the consistency of the information uh, the the um, uh, you mean the consistency coming from the commission? Yes, okay. the, the, infra, the uh, coming from the commission, the the the, the pre-activation of the pre-notification of the areas of, of concern, um, and uh, the overall um, the overall effect of this was 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 the best cycle we've had, and obviously, as for the purpose of this of this roundtable, to try to find some improvement, um, but it, it is an iterative process. Uh, it is a voluntary process, and I think uh, I think you you I think you're right on on point here to try to figure out exactly how we can how we can um, improve the process. Um, but there there uh, as as was suggested by one of the earlier comment commenters, um, you're getting a lot of information right now, and and uh, and implying uh, uh, applying some level of intelligence to it, more analysis to it. Uh, I think it would be more be would, would benefit the FCC and the NCS and FEMA um, and, and other government agencies that that get the information. So some work needs to be done there, and we can discuss that later. John, uh, John O'Connor with the NCS. Um, concur. I think uh, we got out in front of this one for Irene, and the notice uh, helped um, help prepare folks. Uh, one of the things that we sort of hit on in the past is turning it on a little bit after the fact and especially if going into a weekend event you've got to marshal people and move calendar so that helped to uh, help to alert this was the interest in, uh, in align those resources because we know that completing DERS even on a voluntary basis consumes some time and energy to, to make that happen especially for Irene over such a broad area um, the information that was coming out and going down to the field was well received I think when we put DERS together after Katrina, we were very much targeting what is the landscape, what is the awareness of uh, the infrastructure. And uh, uh, you, you pretty much saw a grand capture of that when we went into Irene. I think the next step, though, people take is operationally, now how can I apply that, not just for the awareness. And when we put it together originally, uh, the awareness was to sort of paint the picture of the infrastructure and understand some of the limitations uh, of recovery for that and and set some expectations uh, you know it's not obvious to everyone that it's wireless infrastructure but it depends on wireline for backhaul and if you have lost a number of um, uh, distributed plant elements then you're going to have an impact on the wireless infrastructure and so that's a story and an education that we have to tell uh, but in addition to that we capture some information uh, from the carriers regards um, power situation and if the government uh, enacts any limitations on fuel distribution then you're going to have an impact to the communication infrastructure and that's what we targeted when we originally put DERS together as I said now people are looking at it and trying to put some operational um, uh, ask and answer some operational questions can I put people in the field what's the expectation of services those are the questions that we're coming back to to NCS. 
and a lot of that is a, uh, a changing target. And so some of this you can solve from DERS. Some of this though will have to always be a direct ask. You can't necessarily answer it at that point in time um, just from a simple picture, which is a snapshot in time. Uh, so two pieces that came back to us um, were, can we get more updates versus the once a day? Sorry, that's to industry partners. You mean that more frequent or more in depth? Uh, for the more frequent, if you will, uh, we have established a discipline of uh, taking a snapshot and informing the, the folks when we're going to do that so we can crunch the data and then put together a situational awareness into the reporting that goes to leadership. Um, and so that I think works reasonably well for leadership because you're largely looking at what is the trend and how are we performing. But when you go to the opposite end for the field and the, tech, uh, the people that are doing tactical response, um, they're looking for how can I operationally use and, and the once a day snapshot um, doesn't quite fit their cycle. Uh, the other piece that we have to be cautious of, we put up good information and I'm not picking on you, John, but I saw on the slides here and we said, okay, here's the cell size out for the states. Well, no, it was only for the requested counties in the states. And so how we label the data and put it forward, that misrepresentation can cause you a, a lot of problems because it gets briefed improperly. So uh, we have to be very conscientious of what we put forward as a distillation of it out of DERS and, and educate what it really means. And so um, those are two of the, the aspects that we had from uh, the Irene time frame. Mm -hmm. Charles, I saw you nodding your head as John was speaking. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, uh, to go in line with, uh, I'm Charlie Hoffman from FEMA. Uh, to go in line with what uh, John was saying, uh, our operational tempo requires us on two major briefings a day. And so uh, our, our primary interest in DERS is that it's, it's timely and that it's accurate. Uh, we get asked a lot of questions uh, from the administrator uh, during our briefings as to what the status of the telecommunications infrastructure is, industry is, um, and as as John had put out in this past briefing, that at a 40 percent recovery rate, the, the recovery times were a lot faster than normal. So the data we were getting was 24 hours old at some points, and so there was actually a lot more was recovered than what we were reporting was out. Uh, what was of particular interest to us in, in disaster comms was not so much uh, the, the leadership is always interested in numbers, what's out. What was more interesting to us from an operational standpoint of view was coverage. The coverage maps we were getting. Telling me a cell site tells me that a certain site is out, but it doesn't show me what the coverage is from the surviving sites around it. By having that coverage information, I can do more operational planning about where I can put people in, or as John said, what we can tell people what to expect for services when they get in. Um, a big thing that we felt was missing, and John, you covered it, is the cable information, the, the Verizon Fios information, the Cox cable information. A lot of things now coming out in the bundles, voice, video, and data all on one service, and that reporting not getting getting shown is it really affects the whole community approach to to doing disaster uh, response so that we don't really know a true picture of who can and who can receive information okay let's um, stay focused for the moment and I was going to go to this side of the table um, Larry what did your members have to tell you about how the process worked in Irene well what I what I wanted to emphasize and echo what Jim said was that the communication from the FCC during Irene was um, was excellent. It was uh, it was a confusing event, unlike others, because they would they were rolling out DERS as the hurricane rolled up the East Coast. So there were multiple uh, activations for different counties. And what NAB does is we try to communicate with the FCC on which counties are uh, the or DERS is being activated for. And then we try to pass that notice on to all the stations in our database, radio and TV in our database, just in those counties. And it takes a little time to cull our database to, uh, to nail that down. 
So what I want to emphasize that the, that that John and Julia too, and Jeff and everyone at the FCC, we were in constant contact with them. I was probably pestering John and Julia a little bit too much because I we were trying to get what I heard that you heard that right <laughs> because we won't we we needed every minute especially because it was a weekend event we needed every minute we could to analyze our database to get the information out just to the counties that that needed it so I just wanted to emphasize that they were so responsive and uh, and accessible while all this was going on it w it was terrific for us. Is there any way for you to further articulate what was different in Irene? It was just the um, open lines of communication. Uh, no well, they've always been accessible and 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 responsive. What was different with Irene was that it was very hard to tell where the hurricane was going, and the fact that there were first they activated it, they had to activate it for a couple, of count, uh, a couple of counties in some states and then extend it to other counties in other states and on and on up. And at the same time, at the end of the hurricane, they're deactivating it for counties at the bottom at the, at the, in the southeast. So uh, it was more the fact that they were so responsive and accessible during this kind of series, multiple kind of event. Okay. All, uh, yeah. Well, what about Don and Mark? What do you all... Um, have to add about your experience with Mark. So uh, I, I agree with, with Jim and, and Larry's comments. I, I thought the uh, NCC and the NCS and the FCC did a good job of coming up front, allowing us the opportunity to get our systems ready to report on certain areas within the strike zone. So that was definitely helpful. Um, the, the other thing I'll add is the um, the 11 o'clock time frame for the outage reports is, is a good time for our company. It, it allows us to um, get out and do some reconnaissance work uh, in daylight hours get a good understanding of what impact looks like and be able to be more factual and accurate on our reporting so uh, the 11 o'clock time frame I think works very well for industry um, I'll also um, kind of reiterate the fact that um, this Hurricane Irene just the the sheer volume of territory that it covered and the number of reports that had to be generated uh, was stressful on I'm sure all parties but definitely on the reporting aspect um, Cox had numerous reports they had to file for, for DERS and for NORS to uh, apply with the the order and the, the voluntary measures okay Don uh, <coughs> excuse me Don Samuel Time Warner Cable most of our reporting problems were we've restructured the company and we had to find new ways to get the information it took us about a day to get the people out of bed and say we need this information and finding the right people but we did uh, our our VOIP and broadband is reported on NORS so the information is available uh, I, what's the correlation between NORS and DERS the correlation here John um, there, there, there's a, a strong relationship uh, between NORS and DERS when we activate DERS, our outage reporting is not required in the disaster area. So if you have a, um, a outage in the disaster area, if your company provides the information in DERS, you do not have to file a network outage report. And that was, that was put out in a public notice and a few other things. Um, the, the, the reason for that is we're, we're trying to actually reduce the burden on companies and trying to, if we're asking you to report in one system, we don't want to have to make you report, you know, in three other places at the same time. So uh, we've, we've, we've tried to make sure that, that there, there, there is not duplication of reporting. Um, by the way, with NORS, we do not require people currently to report on voice over IP outages right now and there is a currently a proceeding in place uh, that w w w where we're uh, attempting to extend outage reporting but that's a different matter with again with respect to NORS and DERS our goal is to to uh, not have people have to do duplicate reporting and and one of the reasons why we did set up DERS was because we're, uh, we're asking for ongoing information and we're also asking for 
much less information in DERS on the cause of the outage and stuff. Because what we're really interested in DERS is to track what's up, what's down, what's, what has power problems, what doesn't have power problems. So we have a different goals in DERS and in NORS, and we try not to have, again, duplicate reporting. I'm sorry. Well, I would say a high percentage of our outages was due to loss of uh, the power grid in that area. So is there any way that you can track the outages on the power side of the industry? Are connect <clears throat> somehow now to be connected to that because we are directly tied to that. All of our hub sites have backup power. Uh, our major hub sites have generator and can run for a week or more. Uh, but when you get down to the homes, when you're out of power, you're out of everything. The we do not directly get any information from. Um, the, p the power companies um, for DERS. Um, when we're preparing the reports, I honestly don't think we would have time to actually analyze it and put it together even if we got the information. We typically get the information in DERS, uh, as uh, Mark said, around 11 o'clock. Uh, com uh, companies are are asked to provide the information around 11 o'clock and 11 a.m. just to be clear 11 a.m. sorry yeah 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time um, what happens is um, a fair amount of the information then generally comes in around 11 15 11 30 uh, we, we end up having to clean uh, the information uh, and by about between 12 and 1 on the DERS website, the people who have direct access to the DERS website, they can, like NCS, they can generate reports. They can generate the maps, the charts, and virtually everything that we put out in the formal reports at 1 o'clock. What we then do is, uh, we copy a, a number of the tables. Um, we copy a number of the maps um, and a number of other things, and we put it in formal reports. But the information uh, that's put in uh, around 11 o'clock is actually available at uh, around 1 o'clock um, to, 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 to people who have direct access to, to the DER system. And again, the only people. No, the people who have direct access is just, just NCS. They're the only organization that, that's able to get the, 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 the direct reports out of it, uh, outside of the FCC. But all I'm saying is, in terms of it being timely, it's about as close to being as timely as you could possibly get uh, when the reports come out. Um, Andy, I'm wondering if um, you have additional information from any of your members? Um, not really. I think uh, Mark and Don summed it up well. I, I would say in a word, we, we, were, we were pleased. The way it works at NCTA is when we get the uh, DERS notification, we turn right around and send it to our members that are participating in DERS, which is, uh, which is most of them, and we certainly encourage them to participate in, uh, in the DERS uh, program. We find it of value. Um, I think the only uh, the only complaint really, other than you know maybe some fine tuning in the way the data is uh, inputted, and we can get into those uh, perhaps in more gritty detail later or, or offline, uh, was just the fact that it happened over a weekend, and uh, so people had to scramble. So if these hurricanes would would only cooperate, this would be a much better system in my in my humble opinion. But um, if I could level just maybe one criticism on the process this time around, I thought it went to as smooth as any as, as I've seen is that. Um, I don't think we got DERS notifications until maybe 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock on Friday afternoon. And while I'm certainly around, you know, it, I can't guarantee that uh, some of the staff members and some of the major operators are, are going to be around on Friday afternoon. They've got families and lives outside of uh, the workspace. Uh, but, it, you know, if we could work on a process, maybe I think we know that the hurricane's coming. 
Uh, we don't always know exactly, you know, how we're going to track it. But if we could get as much advance notice uh, as we could that, hey, we were thinking about activating DERS beyond, you know, be on alert, uh, condition orange or, or what have you, uh, for this coming weekend, we'll, you know, we can always stand down later. I think that would be helpful. We could gather the resources that we need, especially on these uh, events that happen over the weekend. I think that would be helpful. So. Okay. Now, Stacy, I don't know. Did you all have any assets in the in the area? Okay. So I was going to start by echoing a lot of the comments that were already made. Um, the DERS process this time went very well. The communication was was excellent um, for activations and deactivations. I think it went pretty seamlessly. Overall, for those that have participated in the, the development of DERS and kind of the process to date, um, I think we've made a lot of significant changes over time. The FCC has been very receptive to the input from the carriers and from the industry as a whole of things that work well and that do not work well, and they've made some significant changes to fix those issues. So I'd like to thank you first and foremost for that. Um, we, we as well do find the, the data collection mechanism very helpful from a carrier perspective. Um, we specifically like and, and support that it's a single entity asking us for information and that you're working with your government partners to share it broadly. Um, in situations, even just earlier this year, where maybe a DERS activation could have been considered and, and was not activated for whatever reason, there were a lot of different ask points within our, our company, and I heard the same throughout the industry. So with this particular instance, I would, uh, again, commend that it was a single effort um, on the government's part to, to collect the information and to get it shared appropriately. I think you did a great job there. Um, we, we as well support that this effort um, as we move forward continues to be a voluntary effort. Um, and then there were some comments made earlier about the level of information, for instance, that was shared on your slides and um, that is shared probably within the government entities and whatnot. And again, want to support the thought that it remain confidential um, and that there is a certain level of information that can and can't be shared. I know in a forum like this, which probably um, limits what maybe you would have shared otherwise with, with the, the government as a whole. So, um, and then to the part of the, the single report that's done at, ni at 11 o'clock, 9 a.m. Mountain for me, um, during a, a disaster activation, that actually works very well for a carrier. It does give us an opportunity to collect our information, make sure that it is as, as relevant as it needs to be, if certainly there is a need for, for some more, I would just request that you uh, you work with us as the industry or as a carrier to consider how best to do that. Um, in some situations, it might be more relevant than, than other situations. So um, I would just ask that you, you consult with us and we can work through that. Thank you. Um, any final thoughts about how the process went in Irene? Mark. Uh, comment for uh, for Cox and this goes back to Charles from FEMA so uh, Cox Communications did participate in DERS and we we do report on switch outages um, voice impact and CATV impact and to uh, to go along with the uh, comments in in the rear um, when when our CATV plan is down it's all digital so when digital's down our ISP connectivity is down and those subscribers would, would in turn not be able to use that service as well so basically anything that rides across that digital plant would, would be impacted at that point. Uh, we do report on DLCs down. That's what we consider our fiber nodes down, and that's where you'll get uh, the voice impact from our, our company. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so that's a, a nice seg. Rich, although find a mic. First, DERS uh, also allows uh, companies to report their needs such as a generator, fuel, and so forth. And so when that comes in, John Healy makes sure that it's passed on to the NCS and also to the uh, FEMA person on scene so that they can uh, start the process to find a resolution. The uh, second thing I wanted to mention about power, um, we also work with the NCS who has information about, who can collect information about power outages and power restoration. You know so what, Rich, they, they are introduce yourself so people know okay. your perspective. My name is Richard Lee, and I coordinate the FCC's disaster response team. And we work very closely with FEMA and the NCS to coordinate all of the needs of, of the companies. Thanks. Um, still a nice segue into discussing um, 
we'd like to hear your thoughts about the possibility of extending DERS to cover uh, VOIP and broadband services. Obviously, the picture we're creating in DERS is um, only good to the extent that it actually covers the way the network is being used and the way consumers are um, receiving and making their communications. So obviously, with um, nearly a third of residential lines uh, VOIP at this point, um, there's clearly a big hole. Um, so we'd like to start a discussion now about the possibility of extending the voluntary reporting in DERS to cover VOIP and broadband services. Who would like to start? Stacy. Um, so to begin with, um, I, I don't know that everybody at the table was, was involved in the discussions when DERS was developed. Um, I know several were. I, I would like to say that while we can maybe move down the path of discussing that, I would strongly support the same mechanism whereby the FCC and the industry and other government entities come to a table similar to this and we talk about what, what is feasible, um, what can be reported, what's appropriate to report, if anything at all. And that if we go down that path as well, that it's something that would um, again, be voluntary and confidential and would be in the same form and fashion that, that DERS is assembled today. Andy. Uh, Andy with uh, NCTI. So I certainly support Stacy's uh, comments. I think our, our, um, our members are willing to engage on a, on a dialogue on all the points that uh, Stacy mentioned. It may, it may be just a clarifying question on my uh, on my part, uh, John, at the, during your introduction, you mentioned that uh, I think that the FCC acknowledges that in the case of cable, for example, and I'm sure it's the case for other platforms as well, uh, that when you do get outage information, I think there's acknowledgement that that probably affects other services as well because we're carrying it on the same pipe. Um, I think what you're missing is some fidelity on how many customers are out uh, based on those outages. So what you get today as a customer count, you have to assume that's, for example, in cable, that's CATV. But you don't know, there's nothing that calls out whether how many broadband subscribers are out versus how many voice over IP subscribers is out. Is that a fair assessment of where you guys are at with this right now? Um, yes, in fact, that's a good assessment. Uh, right now, when we get um, the, the C, we, we used to call them the CATV reports, and it was clear that we were at asking just about video services. Uh, we did assume that the um, generally that all the services were out when, 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 when the video service, but we have no, no idea whether there was um, the company, um, well, Cox or whatever, um, served a large number of uh, uh, VoIP customers. They, they served a large number of, of internet access customers. Uh, and we were getting, uh, we, we, we were getting questions on what was kind of the breakdown, and we couldn't answer that question. So, 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 so your question is right on. I mean, that's sort of what we're looking for. Uh, let me also comment on 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 something that Stacy brought up. Um, if we do ex uh, um, extend the the um, the process, in other words, we, we get additional templates or we in include some additional fields in what we're collecting. We would we plan on following the same exact process that we did with when we set up DERS. In that process, what we did is we worked with associations, we worked with NCTA, uh, we had separate discussions with NCTA, with NAB, we had separate discussions with the major um, um, uh, carriers, uh, the major industry groups, we would have all those because the, the idea is if you have a voluntary process, if you don't get buy-in, you're not going to get any information. So we, we, we would follow the, uh, and, and, and we would have a, a series of meetings. It wouldn't be just one, but the idea would be to get buy-in. We would have NCS at the table with us because they're the the sponsoring organization for DERS, and we work directly with them on every aspect of DERS. So they would be at the table on, on any of the, the, the succeeding discussions. Uh, 
we, we believe that this is the beginning. This is not the end. In other words, this round table is the beginning of the discussion. So I, I just wanted to alleviate your fears that, 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 that this process was, was not going. Uh, we do plan on following a very similar process to what we, were, what we did with DERS. Um, when we originally set up yours, I'm sorry. Well, and I'm going to jump in. It seems to me that it's not just a matter of, um, it's not just about counting noses. It's about the idea that um, video delivery plays a different role than the ability to make a phone call in emergency response. You know, can you reach 911 or can you get EAS announcements? It seems to me that each has, I'm not seeing any nodding from our friends from FEMA and NCS, so I'm hoping that, um, but it seems pretty logical to me. It's not just about, um, uh, there is a reason to break out the services, is my point. And, and by the way, in the discussions, you know, uh, we would be obviously open. Maybe, uh, maybe there's a, a different piece of information that, that I haven't thought of. I'm certainly not clairvoyant, and I'm certainly not uh, completely knowledgeable about uh, how CAT, uh, I'm sorry, how about how cable systems work, how about a lot of, a lot of the new services work. So I, ha I personally and the FCC has to personally rely on industry segments to, pro to, to suggest what is the, the appropriate information that we should be collecting that's the type of information that you can provide and the type of information that is the most useful uh, in terms of uh, providing it to, to FEMA and to, to NCS. Jim. So, so, so basically, you know, we're talking about, we're talking about the over-the-top services um, that are dependent on either wired or wireless broadband access. Um, and even since Katrina, there's been, you know, th the improvements that you all have made in DURS and the, analyti the analytics that you've applied to it have improved a lot. Um, but I'd like to discuss with the group, and I'd like to pick up on Don's discussion, if we, you know, there, there's, there, are, there are known interdependencies, and that primary interdependency is power. Um, and I would think for situational awareness for the government, it is far more responsible to overpaint than underpaint the situation. And if you take, if you, if you were to take a, an understanding of what key components or elements of our networks are out based with commercial power outages, you would get a very quick, very, albeit raw, but very probably uh, accurate statement of what exactly is going on in a particular market, marketplace specifically a highly populated marketplace. So so I, I understand I understand your I understand exactly what the commission wants to do, uh, what the what NCS and FEMA is interested in, but are there quicker ways to get there that are quite frankly a little less intrusive? Um, number two, you know, getting back to the foundational elements of doers, it was voluntary. It it was it it, it is voluntary. It is something that is rapidly done. Um, and number three, first, and number three, probably the most important, is that our primary mission during a crisis is recovery and restoration, quite frankly. Reporting is not our primary mission. And we have to do that. We are incented by the marketplace and our, and our customers and our responsibility as licensees to restore service as quickly as possible. So, so I think one of the things I'd like to explore is there is another is there is there is there are ways to do this with the with the analytics and intelligence that are out there. Mark. Yeah. Mark Bay with Fox Cable. Uh, so I'll uh, definitely uh, jump on Jim's bad bang in there and, and agree with his uh, synopsis that um, th there there are definitely multiple ways for customers to engage now and, and find out um, what their surroundings are like whether they're in immediate danger wh whether it's through. Their, their cable plant, whether it's through radio, uh, multiple channels that they have to, to uh, attach to media. Uh, when you move into this VoIP arena, you, you start moving more into the customer premium, and a lot of these access devices are home powered. And if you don't have electricity at that home residency, you, your input device is not going to work and you're not going to have access to the network. So 
uh, you know, commercial power and those restoration activities are critical in those areas. Fair enough. Um, I see nodding heads. Does anybody have any? John? John O'Connor, NCS. Um, let me echo and, and tie into some of the codependency pieces. Um, it's, it's very much recognized that power is, uh, is a driving factor in the major impact that we usually have uh, to the comms infrastructure for these events. And through, through government channels, uh, what FEMA does in bringing uh, the, uh, the ESFs together and Department of Energy, we get some insight as to the areas that are impacted and correspondingly how that's uh, impact communications. I think uh, communications has evolved just as noted a moment ago. Um, when we put DERS together very much, we looked at the infrastructure and you would go still with some old school thought. If they had copper and they would have the phone service at their house. Well, how many you know still have the old copper lines and how many still can draw voltage from the telcos? Uh, that population base is a lot s smaller now. And so discussions that I'm, I'm, I'm hearing today is, you know, DERS, we look very much at infrastructure. Now we're very much kind of looking at services and how do you classify that and uh, all concur that uh, trying to extrapolate that if we've got this many customers out, well, then there might be a, some assumption that they've lost a bundle of services. Um, I think some of the driving factors on the government side are uh, two-way communications. One, can the customer make his 911 call? And we know that that's evolving and going different directions. And there's going to be different players possibly in that arena. So how do you incorporate that? Uh, on the, on the uh, other side of it, you've got the government wanting to message to the population to give guidance, evacuations, repopulation plans. How do you get back in there? And what level of services you can expect? And what the population consumes now is a heck of a lot different than what they did during Katrina. And so you've got, uh, you know, your twits and tweets and Facebook and I want my instant messaging uh, services. Um, they're not necessarily incorporated here. And we know that there is a regulatory voluntary discussion that wraps around engaging those partners, but uh, something that needs to be put into the fold because they are the, some of the overtop service providers that we're discussing here they own some infrastructure to make their pieces work, but their delivery comes over uh, the providers. And so they've got to be wrapped into the equation of what we're thinking about. And I said, there's a large framework of how do you do this on a voluntary basis? Is there a regulatory discussion, which I think is probably mm -hmm. beyond the scope of this panel here that needs to be looked at? And so those are some of the things that we're looking at on the government side. As I said, we're adopting how the new world communicates and how we message. And there is a sense for how effective is that? I know in industry, you want to measure the effectiveness of what you're delivering. Similarly, on the government side, we'd like to be able to understand some of that. What's the success? And do I need to modify how I message? OK. Um, I want to make sure we actually hear from some of the other broadband players. So Kate, I want to make sure we don't um, leave you out of the discussion. Um, Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for including me today. Um, you know, first of all, I guess I would start off by saying that really I'm in listening mode. This is a new issue for certainly me and, and a lot of players in my organization. Um, I am I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to hear some of the comments, particularly the last comments made by John here when talking about over the top providers. When I had had a couple discussions leading up to today about what were the kinds of over-the-top providers that the FCC was considering in including in a voluntary structure and reporting into DERS, it was mentioned to me, you know, companies like Vonage and other people like that. And one of my responses was, well, uh, that is a company, but uh, understand if this is a road that you want to go down, there are far you know, more companies in who provide very broad service opportunities and, and products to users who are religious users of these services. Um, and I, I think that they should probably be included in this conversation. I think you'll need to hear input from those companies too, particularly because I, I'm a little confused at this point about that over-the-top services piece. Um, a lot of that will have to do with the electric power piece. And I'm not sure if I were a website and I provided a lot of different services from video to 
email to chatting to you know et cetera et cetera but it is a way that people keep in touch with their um, relatives and friends especially during crises I would say I have a data center on the west coast and throughout the world I have you know my facilities weren't affected by this storm what you know yes when people lose power to their home they may not be able to get on or if they lose mobile power they may not be able to get on so I think I think there's probably a, a much further discussion that needs to to happen um, and that electric power piece is going to be very important also from the standpoint of an ISP you know um, there are a lot of acronyms around the table today and people who work in this world are very familiar with them and know, know people in a personal relationship and know the benefits of working with the FCC during, um, during a uh, natural disaster or other, other disaster, um, and certainly working with their partners at DHS. But there are, there are huge segments of industry who aren't engaged in that way, and this would be an, a completely new construct for them. They don't have the staff like the other companies they don't do reporting today so this is this is a very big conversation I guess that that you're starting and I would echo the comments made earlier by Stacy and saying that um, I, I would hope that as the conversation goes forward it's a thorough conversation and all parties are included because I think you're gonna have a lot of people who are very new to this understood um, don't get rid of the mic just yet Okay. so let's See, talk if we can about what that world would look like where um, we are asking for the voluntary filing of information in DERS about VOIP and broadband services um, have um, without any sort of commitment what do you think would make sense for some of the members you were just talking about I'm not sure I'm prepared to answer that at this time. I'm really here to hear what you know. You all at the commission have to you say on say that and take it back. I, did hear that. Okay. Um, I can say that I will take it back and try to get you some feedback. Um, what by, by the way, I, I do believe that we we will have ongoing discussions with that portion of the industry that which we have not reached out to before with respect to disaster reporting, and we will talk to you for. A, and uh, the idea will be to, to work, with, uh, work with that segment, just like we worked with the, the wireline segment when we, were, when we originally set up DERS and the wireless segments, broadcasters and whatever, um, so, that, so that the information is logical and um, that the, the companies that are involved uh, have direct input into it and th they make the recommendations of, on what type of information would be the most appropriate. If any, th 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 there, there may be some segments or maybe some things that we decide that is not appropriate to collect. You know, th that does happen. You know, th it, it, it's not a fate accompli that we're going to be automatically extending it to certain segments. On the other hand, the, the, the intention is to try to get some information on um, numbers of customers that are out of service that have the, these major new types of broadband services and if there's a way to get it uh, we'll work with you to try to figure out the best way and the, and the most appropriate way to try to get that information again you guys are the experts on it um, a lot more than I am Mark so, so I mentioned earlier that the Hurricane Katrina and, and the sure volume of territory that it encompassed uh, stressed resources to get the filings done uh, Irene, right? Irene, sorry, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Irene, most particularly. Um, along that train, you know, we really need to understand if, if there was more of a national event that went on, what would that look like for DERS reporting? So, so I think there are some health issues we need to understand from DERS general if a, if a wide scale event were to occur and, and the type of information that would be expected amongst the carriers that are represented here before we even encroach on anything new because if it was a national event uh, I, I don't think many of us around the table here could report at that level at 11 a.m. It's probably also not something where we get a lot of advance warning. Um, Jim, I'm, I'd love to go back to you and find out what you think about, um, you, you sort of addressed this before but let's move on to what 
you think would be um, the type of information and the, the way to collect information <coughs> about VOIP and other broadband services if that's what happens? Well, I mean, I, I kind of go back to my previous statement. I, I believe, I, I believe if, if, we, if we did a post analysis of Irene as you just did, which was a great job, I think if we overlaid that with some power grid information, I think the questions that you got from your leadership could be answered relatively accurately. How many people had access to over-the-top services? Well, if you assume they had either wireless, they didn't have wireless or, or wired broadband access, and they didn't have power, equals X. And uh, I, so, 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 so again, we're we're kind of we're kind we're trying to we're doing that we're doing that calculus right and the calculus is so yes government has a has a has an open requirement for this information what is the balance between taking this the 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 industry present and dragging and and, and dragging another industry in because communications is as John said, it's gone far beyond just the copper line now. So it's, it's now multiple players, as Kate said. I mean, couldn't even list them all. Is it, is it better? Is it, is, it, is, it, is it a better use of the commission's time to go out and try to bring all those players into the tent or, or, or create a reasonable model of what the impact of the following elements being offline has on the population what is the what is the better what's the better va what's the better value there in terms of the limited resources that government has and the limited time that you have in the, in the time of a crisis um, because you are making that trade-off between accuracy and speed we make that trade-off on a daily basis on an hourly basis so so th that's really that's really kind of what I would like to explore John, correct me if I'm wrong. If the current participants, what would be the effect if the current participants in DERS reporting also reported on their VOIP and other broadband services? That would get us pretty far, though, wouldn't it? Um, probably yes. I'm not in. By, by the way, in. in I'm in. As I said, this this discussion is the beginning. Um, I'm not sure that the, the increased burden or whatever in terms of getting uh, counts of uh, VoIP customers out because of like router major routers being out, access routers being out, whatever. Um, see, one thing that does happen is is if. If, 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 if there's a loss of service to an access router or the piece of equipment that, that, that the uh, um, that your U-verse service uh, when, when somebody has uh, U-verse service the, the signal goes from their their house to a piece of equipment if that piece of equipment is, um, is out um, if that piece of equipment is is gone, all the, those customers will lose lose service, irrespective of whether they have power at their house or not. Um, and, and and one of the things, uh, I I do not think just overlaying a power grid is the complete answer. Uh, I do think that that that, it, that, it, that it's a valuable thing to do. I think that it's it enhances the information, and I think it's very important to understand the the interaction between power. But 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 I'm I'm not sure that uh, collecting additional information um, directly on 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 some of the uh, on VoIP and on. Uh, would not be very beneficial in terms of describing what the effect is on the uh, on, on the overall communications assets, and I'm not convinced yet that that 
that, that some minor additions can be placed in DERS that we can get um, more accurate and more complete information. For example, for, for CATV, I mean, just getting a breakdown of, of the services that are out, I mean, that I think would be all that would be required. In other words, we would, we would get what we're really looking for if we got a breakdown of the number of customers th th that lost um, um, telephone services, the ones that lost TV services, and the, lo the numbers that lost whatever. I think that would be all we would really need. I'm, I, now, I'm, I may be wrong, but, but, but the, and, I, and I'm not, not sure that the same kind of thing couldn't couldn't be, couldn't be gotten from from the wireline broadband providers. Um, so all I'm saying is, I think we can have our cake and eat it. I think we can get the, the information into DERS that we need, that's useful, um, and and gives a breakdown. Um, and I also think that your your idea of over overlaying the power grids, because I mean that really does give you a lot of information. It's very useful. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of agreeing with you, but I, I'm not agreeing that that we, we can just just overlay the power grid and forget everything else. I I I, I think that's not the, the I don't believe that's the answer to the question. Well, and um, my boss has indicated that he has some input, so I'm well advised to go there next. You don't have to, but you identify himself. Will be in huh? <laughs> I'm Jeff Goldthorpe, and uh, uh, with the FCC, and. Uh, it's it's also true that that more than half of the of the service outages that we observed in Irene, and it's not just true in Irene; it was true in Gustav and and Ike as well, were were caused by backhaul, not by power. When that surprised us in Irene, normally it's you know power maybe doesn't dominate, but it's but this time backhaul outages. Sixty percent. Yeah, it was higher. Backhaul some. outages were more. So that was surprising. It may have been something that was unique about the event, but it just goes to to show that that while a a um, analysis of the power infrastructure and the condition of that infrastructure is important and would shed light, particularly in light of the fact that it's already been raised that if the um, if the network termination device on the customer end is without power, the customer is going to be without service before too long. And that's something that's newer. That's something new. And uh, we don't have a way of capturing that, that aspect of this. And that would be one of the questions that we'd have to be asking in the next few months. As, a, as to the, um, um, the, the point about other, other sectors that, we, that, are, that have gone unnamed very tactfully, okay? <laughs> but um, other folks that should be at the table and aren't at the table today, um, and that's true, but all of those folks, I think, rely on uh, on broadband access. If the customer is without broadband access, without ISP, without access to their ISP, then th then the other services that we're talking about here are are um, are unavailable to them. And so um, so maybe the so the the threshold question that we're trying to answer and and get some insight into is um, is there a way to know about the um, the ability of an end user in a disaster to get access to the internet, so that these are these services that they might rely on um, for um, for for voice, for whatever, for for information, are are available to them. So um, um, so so we're not going. So so that's I wanted to make that point uh, for those two points. Okay. Well, and John raised. Uh, the the idea that perhaps an appropriate reporting measure is whether a major router is out um, for broadband services. So I guess I'm interested to know what others think about that possibility. Well, I, this is Andy with uh, NCTA, and I think uh, I, you know if that's the cause of the outage, I think you know uh, people that report those outages are, are you know are are. are uh, you know, can certainly report that's the nature of the outage. You know, whether it's power, whether it's router, whether it's a switch, whether whatever. I mean, you know, you're, you're, we're, you know, DERS asks the the, uh, the reporter to uh, you know fill in the field, as it were, about what the what the nature of the outage is. But uh, you know, I want to go back to a point that I think um, 
uh, John and, and Jeff are making that, um, you know, we, we can only report what, you know, with confidence and, and quantify the services we provide. I, you know, what assumptions you make about whether that affects over the top providers, whether it's power or the nature of the outage in our own systems, I think is something that's outside of our control. So, I mean, we, as facilities providers, we could, you know, perhaps fill in the blank or fill in the field, if you will, for voice over IP, for, for broadband, and for video in the case of cable, but I think that's as much as we can stand up and represent. No. And I do understand that. In fact, we, we, we don't expect that you have individual counts of individual customers out. I mean, that's, that's, I think that's the, a fair assumption, yeah. Yeah, I mean, w we're not asking people to count up individual customers out. We, we never do that. I mean, that's not the, the general. First, some of the hesitation around the table may be that there are open dockets, as Jeff just pointed out. Some of these issues are being discussed there. Um, we have filed comments. Um, I think a good majority of us have fi filed comments are in the process of replies and otherwise. So some of the issues and questions you're asking are difficult for us to maybe expand on beyond what was already filed. Um, secondly, I would just like to reiterate that I think and I've heard from around the table today, there is some openness to some future discussions to figure out the best way to head with that question. Um, if, if there are certain aspects that can or should be reported, if they're appropriate to or otherwise. So I would just again recommend that um, we maybe get deeper into that question, answer it in a forum um, similar to that. Okay. Now, Michael, could you get the wireless mic over behind Charles? I think there was someone there who wanted to make a comment. I'm David Bigger with the NCC. Uh, one thing that I would like to <clears throat> just tell point everyone, out. Just, just for the uninitiated, tell everyone what NCC is. Oh, the National Coordinating Center for Communications. We're the 24 by 7 operational watch for the NCS and for the COMISAC. Uh, one of the things that I would like to point out is probably obvious to everyone, but just for my own sanity, I'd like to point it out. Um, comments are kind of being driven by a hurricane. We have to also be prepared to run DERS for man-made man -made events that might require long-term in-place sheltering. At that point, we need to be able to know how many people that we can get emergency broadcast messages to to provide information for them for those areas. <clears throat> and if we don't have an idea of, I can take a map, a power map, and I can look at a community and I can see I have no power in the community. How many of those people are wireline that can plug up an old-fashioned phone and get telephone service? How many of those people are VoIP? How many of those people do not have a radio that um, has batteries? They're relying on their cell phone, they're relying on their, their cable television, or they're relying on their computer to provide their radio uh, or whatever. So the entire communications arena has evolved for the customers and it's evolved for industry. And the reporting of this stuff is getting rather convoluted because we trying to report to FEMA and tell them that in this town of 50,000 people, they're getting reports that 35,000 are out of power, but I'm getting reports that only have 5,000 customers out of service for communications. So we need to try to find somewhere where we can let FEMA know so that they can let the, uh, the other people in senior positions of the government know that in this disaster area that could be natural or man-made that we have the fo following family sheltering in place that don't have any way of finding out what's going on so we have to look at that also I think Jim, go ahead. Well, you know, my understanding of IPAWS which is uh, run by FEMA which is basically um, an integrated public alerting warning system which uses all modalities uh, to to basically use um, uh, the, the the environment if, if wireless doesn't work uh, broadcast radio may work or broadcast TV may work uh, you know basically bell ringer technologies that say get to the get get to the medium that's working to work that's readily available to you to get more information um, um, I guess maybe I'm inferring something more than what you're saying, but um, if, if you're looking at us 
if you're looking at the telecommunications industry to be a surrogate for the number of survivors in a specific area, whether or not they're on their lines or not, that may not be the best way to go about it. If I'm on, I'm, I mean, I, I think what you said was you not you want to do you want to know exactly how many people can receive messages in a specific area. Is that is that what you asked? We're probably not the best people to come to for that. Uh, I mean, we don't know how many survivors they are. We don't know. We don't know what the actual conditions on the ground are. Um, we may have a network that's working perfectly, but there's nobody there. There may be houses that are all lit up and broadband going through, but there's nobody there. We don't. We don't know that. All right. So. As the moderator, I'm thinking, how do I bring this back around now to talk about what, um, uh, to talk about um, what sort of improvements we might want to see in our current DERS system, and um, what we think we might want to see if we added in VOIP and broadband services. Um, and the, the the final question, th that those are the two questions on the table. In addition. How do we encourage more participation in the voluntary reporting system? John, the last time we talked about these numbers, it was something like 3,800 participants enrolled in DERS. Is that correct? Actually, I don't remember, but I think it's, that's about it. Yeah. It was pretty close. Um, so, how do we? Well, let, let's. How do we encourage more participation in DERS? And are there improvements we can think about today that would help along those lines? And Larry is pulling the mic closer, so I'm going to go there. Um. Well, f first, my understanding is there's about a thousand participants from broadcasting in the DER system, but that number needs to be clarified because many of those companies that are registered in DERS, at least for radio and, and maybe TV also, could represent four or five, thousand ten. Stations. No, not thousands, but four or five, ten, three hundred, four hundred. Who knows? Uh, there's a handful of companies that have hundreds of stations, but but. Um, so, I mean, we would estimate that although your number is about 3,500, if you just take the broadcasting, it's some multiple of 1,000 that, that includes individual radio and TV stations. We don't know exactly how many, but it could be two, three, four thousand, which is a very good percentage of, of radio and TV stations. We think that there's a very high percentage of all the TV sta uh, 2,500 TV stations around the country and, and a substantial percentage of, of radio stations also that are covered by these registrations in, in DERS. So your actual number of participants is probably a lot higher than 3,500. No, I see your point. You're right about that. I am thinking, though, for example, of some internal discussions we had over the past few months that um, it has not been difficult to convince uh, communications providers in all sectors in the Gulf states to enroll in DERS. Sometimes we've had a little more difficulty, John, correct me if I'm wrong, in getting those, um, for example, broadcast stations in the Northeast to enroll because it is so infrequent that they would be part of a DERS activation, and then here we have Hurricane Irene. So, John, what were you? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, um, typically what happens when we have a, uh, a hurricane in a particular area, um, we get a, a large increase in the number of participants in DERS in that area because a, n a number of our um, NAB reaches out to broadcasters um, and CTA reaches out to the cable companies, ACA reaches out, oh, um, I'm sorry, our, our media bureau reaches out to all the cable companies in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the general area. We're, we are going to be reaching out to ACA in the, in the future, so. Um, the, what generally happens is we, we get a, a, a larger number of companies in the disaster area, a large number of the broadcasters, uh, uh, cable system operators, um, even the small carriers. Uh, the, uh, we still, in, in certain states like Ohio, we don't have anywhere near as n a greater participation. Maybe it's not as necessary, but we don't have as great a participation in certain states because we've never had um, uh, 
a DERS activation in that particular area. Most of the DERS activations have been in the Gulf Coast, so we have a really good participation in generally in the Gulf Coast. Um, we're, we have a much better participation uh, on the, in the Northeast than we had in the past because of I Irene. We also got, got a fair number of people because of uh, s some of the storms have moved up the coast. Um, and we send out preliminary messages and all kinds of things about DERS. Um, we're always continually trying to improve the participation in DERS. Um, I don't think we'll ever get it as good as I would hope. Um, someday maybe we'll get 95 percent. Uh, we do cover all the big companies generally all the big cable operators except one at this point in time participates. All the, uh, uh, the major wireline and wireless carriers. Um, so I, we, we, we have all the big companies and right now we're working on trying to get the, the smaller groups. Barbara, would it be mean of me to ask you, since you represent small cable systems, um, whether there's uh, enough awareness about DERS in that community? hazard a guess in answer to that. Um, I, I would be surprised if there were wide-scale awareness of this program among some of the smaller and smallest cable operator. And um, Julie, if you're still on from Minot, North Dakota, I'm very interested to know how you first heard about DOORS. You're with a small carrier, right? Yes, that tr that's true. We're just a, a local exchange carrier with about 50,000 access lines. Um, you know, I've, I've seen DERS, of course, on the FCC website. Um, the first I was really informed of it was when, um, when Steve Lisney asked me, our CEO asked me if I would sit in on this conference call. Um, otherwise, like I said, I was more into the NORS, the outage reporting uh, system. Uh, again, I don't want to um, be unfair, but I'm wondering if you have thoughts about what it would mean for your company to participate on a voluntary basis in DERS um, and what you think would be our best way to approach smaller providers to get them involved in DERS. I would definitely, um, I would definitely look into, into the DERS. It sounds more informative and easier than the NORS system. I guess... Um, you know, other than sending notifications out, NT, you know, maybe NTCA could send notifications out to the smaller companies, inform them of DERS and have them take a look at it. Um, fortunately, we don't have very many disasters and we don't, you know, have to use it too much. But I think it's just a matter of having NTCA send notifications out to everybody. Okay. John? NTCA, that's one of the uh, associations that we work with. We also work with OPASCO, and um, there's several other wire, wireline and wireless associations that we work with. Whenever DERS is activated, I, I send notices to NAB, NCTA, NTCA, OPASCO, uh, the r rural wireline group. Uh, uh, th there's a number of other associations that I send it to. And um, they typically send it to the members that are in the affected area. Since DERS was not in North Dakota, uh, I'm sorry, Irene did not hit North Dakota, fortunately. Um, um, you probably didn't get a message about DERS. Right. Um, I do see it on the Washington Watch where it, it has become effective and, and things like that. but. Um, I believe that's where I see it. I don't. I, maybe it's just the Daily Digest that I see it from the FCC. But yeah, you know, it's it's so it is something new to me anyway. And I, I don't know if the other companies are really aware of it. All right. Thanks, Julie. Larry. Yep. Um, I, I just wanted to to illuminate some of the efforts NAB has made to try to reach out to as many broadcasters as possible. I mean, we tried to present. DERS as a win-win for our members and all radio and TV stations. Um, 
you know, as, as Rich said, you, you could get a potentially big benefit if you're in need of a fuel or a generator and the government can help you uh, locate one of those. And in return, it's really a very simple process just to sign up for DERS. Um, we typically send um, a, a special email notice to all the stations in our database um, promoting DERS once a year, usually at the beginning of the hurricane season to remind them that this is a great program and they should sign up and it could be it turn out it could turn out to be a big help to them uh, during the coming months we have also um, uh, we produced a video by Jamie Barnett and distributed that to uh, all the stations in our database and, and and Jamie made a two or three maybe it was a four minute presentation about DERS and um, again presented it as uh, you know this is a win-win a, a program that that can help broadcasters and um, in addition to that we also did in, in 2009 we did a web uh, kind of a webcast town hall with, with John and um, we got several hundred uh, uh, people tune in for that and and according to John it led to uh, a lot more registrations into DERS so we have been doing what we can I guess I guess if you wanted to increase our, particip our participation in DERS maybe the FCC is is needs to look a little bit closer at all the communications that it has with regulated entities and see if there's uh, anything they could put in there I mean cable companies put things in their bill notices or something like that I don't I don't know what more just posting this video or putting something on the FCC's website there's a lot of stations that don't look at the FCC's website there's nothing so when they get their regulatory free statement it should be PS sign up for DERS <laughs> Well, they don't send the fee statements oh, anymore. Don is shaking his head. Yes. Right. Okay. Well, they don't. I understand. Everyone will <laughs> see that, but I think they stopped the fee statements, right? At least for <laughs> TV and radio. But um, I don't have any suggestions on what kind of uh, communications that go out from the FCC because uh, we want to keep it a voluntary uh, program. Right. But um, maybe there's some other opportunities that we're just not thinking of right now. Okay. Go ahead. I would just repeat what a lot of people have been saying around the table. As someone who is very new to this, who has just been uh, informed about what this is, I did some reading on your website about it, and I've heard some really good feedback from companies who have been participating in this over time. Um, it would be great if the FCC could go back to, you know, the the markets that you're already used to and the segments that you're already used to, and maybe there are huge numbers of people that aren't already aware of what currently happens in DERS before going forward and expanding anything. Secondly, I would say it seems as though through analysis more can be pulled out of the data that's already provided. Or maybe like Andy was saying, there is information in the report already, but it's not something that is, has shined a light on um, in that report. So before saying, you know, we would like over-the-top providers or X kinds of different companies, that there are other things underway where comments are being filed. Um, maybe for the time being, it would be best just to reach out to um, the companies who are reporting and make sure that they understand that they, you know, should be part of that system. Uh, no, I hear what you're saying. I think, though, as John said, that we have all of the major wireline providers and all of the major cable systems except for one. I think at this point we are looking in terms of increasing the number of participants um, reaching out to the smaller providers like SRT who may not be aware of it. And we certainly do work with NTCA and OPASCO to try to reach out to the smaller carriers. I'm not sure that the, I do think right now we cover the, the landscape pretty broadly. Um, and it would always be nice to have um, a greater percentage anywhere we are. But Stacy and Jim, you're both indicating. So um, I, I think the, the we need to go back and, and just recognize what a great job the FCC and its partnership with DHS and FEMA has done uh, post Katrina. Basically, the concept was to stand up this this the situational awareness uh, reporting system, uh, you know, through the leadership of, of, of Jeff and John and others. It, it's now become the gold standard. I mean, it really is a standard. You hear people referring to it. I actually, during Irene, I had I heard people in the White House referring to DERS. Well, you know, five years ago, four years ago, it was like, where the heck do we get the information? Now people know where to get the information. But I think it's important for the FCC to also stand on the attributes it's created. And one of the major attributes that it's created is, number one, it is 
the single point of entry into the companies that are reporting in a disaster or crisis situation. You, you have no idea how valuable that is. While we're trying to make organized, take a chaos and organize it and start recovery and restoration uh, efforts, having multiple calls from federal and state and local officials into our organizations at multiple levels is not constructive. It just doesn't help the process. And with DURS, we're able to say we are reporting information and it trickles down, it trickles down DHS, DHS to, to, to FEMA, FEMA into state EOCs, state EOCs into the county EOCs. And most importantly is there's consistency in the information. What goes in here comes out here. It's consistent. It's not different. And that gives everybody a level of confidence that truly, while the information may not be hourly correct, it was it is when did 24 hours correct or 23 hours correct and and so we're able to we're able to um, uh, relieve a lot of external pressure that comes in from that that used to come in and say we need this report this we need and everybody wants it differently right well we don't have the we don't have the resources to groom all this information differently at a different time scales so that's why we've agreed to do this and this is why we consider it such a success so I mean that's a tremendous attribute to all parties in, in the sector. And I just wanted to remind everybody that. Stacy, I'll start by saying well said. Um, very well said. Um, back to the question about how do you expand um, participation into DERS. As a carrier, we obviously don't know who is or who isn't reporting. I mean, you have access to that information, and that's how you know that you need a broader outreach, if you will. So a couple of things I think were shared that, that would likely be helpful in that effort. One, some sort of an education platform or plan um, so that whether it's an association or a carrier or you're doing some specific, out, specific outreach to a smaller provider of some sort, um, that there's some standard that you can say, this is what DERS is, this is how you access it, here's the generally asked um, questions I know we worked on earlier this year, the frequently asked questions. Um, this is the reference and this is why it's beneficial. So one, I would recommend something along those lines. And then secondly, um, while I think you're doing an excellent job of working with a lot of um, carriers, industry associations and the like, um, if there are some gaps with, with carriers um, that maybe they are aware of it, it would probably be helpful to reach out to them and ask why they're not using it. Are there things that can be done to improve it? Uh, what are the concerns around it? And, and taking those back to consider, is there a way to make DERS more useful to, to carriers that, that are in that situation? So, Rich. Uh, just one comment. Jim, thank you for your, your words. Um, it, it's been a a team effort to get DERS where it is today. But I, I did want to make one comment. DERS is not shared with state and locals. It's kept within our, our, our industry and it gets to FEMA and it's uh, for official use only. There has been some discussion about how this information could be prepared so that FEMA could share it with state officials and local officials, but we're not there yet. Good Thank point. you. I got a little over enthusiastic. And, 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 and the other thing is, the other thing is, the other thing is, is we do greatly appreciate the confidentiality. And that, that is, that is, that is key. paramount. Key. Yeah. Yes. with how the information is summarized, how it is, and where it goes, who it goes to, and uh, how it's shared. It's, it's uh, we, we have SOPs about virtually everything that we do with the, with the DERS information, and it all respects the confidentiality of the information. I, I just would like to echo with what Richard set up. Uh, We've had a very good working relationship with the FCC on DERS and another project that we have going uh, with the FCC roll call. And um, we, totally, we totally get the privacy issue and, and the non-disclosure thing with industry. Uh, obviously, we're understanding the competitive and stuff like that. The bottom line for us is we're, we're not really so much interested in who has the outages, where is the outage. 
because our primary concern is the people out there and serving the people making sure that they're getting the word making sure that they're getting services making sure they're being taken care of uh, certain things that just for instance off of Irene this past time uh, we found out not through reporting but we found out that there wasn't internet services available up in Vermont and we set up one of our mobile units so that people could come in get onto the internet and so they could just pay their bills online and things like that because they had no internet service uh, it's things like that if we know that type of outages if we know that there isn't that kind of coverage in areas that are that that have been devastated or hit by a storm that gives us a much better operational picture of where we can go out and help the people and support the people and, and that and that's the bottom line for us uh, we definitely don't share the information uh, other than with our senior leadership on what outages are out there and as Richard said we're working with the Public Safety Homeland Security Bureau right now to find out how we can get some of this information uh, non attributable to be released down to the state level because a lot of the states have contract with certain carriers certain providers and things like that and this will aid them in understanding where their outages are at and also to help their folks Thank you. Um, we have 10 minutes left so I'm hoping we could give everyone an opportunity to give some sort of parting thoughts and um, if you haven't been able to say what you think would be uh, good improvements to make indoors going forward, we'd love to hear it now. And clearly, as John indicated, this is the very, very beginning of a longer discussion about how to improve DERS in, in many different ways. Um, Stacy, you were writing furiously. Would you like to go first? First, I'd like to thank you for having us here today. I think this has been a good and useful discussion for us all to start the process of, of just figuring out where we go from here. Um, CenturyLink is, is open um, to participating in the future meetings to discuss what, if anything, can be collected um, via DERS for the, the issues we've talked about today. Again, we'd like to reiterate that um, the confidentiality is, is paramount to this, that we believe that it should be a voluntary process and that um, I think to some of the points, John, you made earlier that we'll have to look at what's appropriate to, to report, if anything. So again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I appreciate it. Jim, do you want to stand on your previous remarks? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I just want to I, I agree with Stacy. Um, uh, we do appreciate uh, being invited. And we, we believe that, you know, that there are improvements to DERS that can be made. Uh, how to do that? We just need to, we need to figure that out. Um, but uh, as has been noted uh, several times, you know the the, the landscape is changing rapidly, um, and uh, we uh, may not have the luxury, as was also pointed out, we may not have the luxury of of, a, of two weeks or one week or or even or even a, a day notice of uh, of a crisis. And so, consequently, we'll need to. We'll need to uh, be uh, we'll need to be flexible for that, um, but uh, yeah, uh, AT and T remains committed to to the Duras program and supporting the Duras program. Uh, we look forward to, to, to future discussions and and uh, again, thank you for all the the work. Um, I I really do want to reemphasize that the coordination between DHS and, and and the FCC in this area has has been very constructive in terms of being able to provide the, the government with a situational awareness and and um, um, sorry about my Richard sorry about my misstatement earlier but we also do have people at the state EOC level so we're, we're, they, we, we meet we meet at there too so um, uh, so uh, it is it is our obviously we are we are incented uh, by the marketplace by our responsibility to our customers by our by 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 the public interest to restore service and, 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 uh, and recover service uh, in the affected areas as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible. And, and being able to do that in, with the support of, of, uh, of the government agencies is, is, is the best way for the people. I know you all, you and your organization are new to this particular discussion. We really appreciate your joining us. And um, if you have any, um, Parting ideas, this would be. I want to ask Kate how many cows and colts they have. Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, really, again, thank you for including me in this today. And uh, coming away with this, I mean, I, I guess I can say this I'm happy to go back and evangelize a program that is 
you know, hailed as successful and it is voluntary. And um, certainly where information is kept confidential, I think that is something that is, you know, what, something companies are always very interested in, a, a successful program where they can partner with the government, particularly in a time of a disaster or crisis. Um, I, I would reiterate a couple of things I said earlier, which is that some of the people in the communities that you're going to be looking out to do not have existing relationships with um, the government, um, like some parts of the industry do today. So that's, a, that's going to be something that needs to be built up over time. And I think that's probably across the government, they're looking to do that in, in many different ways. Um, and also, uh, you know, I think there will be a little bit of hesitancy because of an unfamiliarity of working, whether it be directly with the commission or with other parts of the federal government in times of crisis. So there's a little bit of a learning curve there. And I really look forward to a future discussion. Hopefully, um, you know, I'll, we'll be invited back and uh, can participate in a further conversation about what the different technologies are and what you're really looking for in the future. And we can, um, you know, hopefully participate in that. Well, thank you. We, Thanks. We appreciate your willingness to start discussing that with us. Um, uh, we, why don't we go to the rest of our provider community and then we'll go back to our government partners. So, Mark? Yeah. I want to thank you for the opportunity of having me here as well today. And uh, at the end of the day, this is really all about disaster recovery and, and how we work together as industry, as a partners to restore service and to make sure people are um, informed about the disaster that's occurred in their area. We understand our responsibilities in that. And uh, theirs has been a great forum, and we look forward to continued support. Thanks. <coughs> Don, Andy? One of the benefits of going near last is that uh, all your colleagues, who are much smarter than you are, get to make all these points. And I, I just simply have to agree. I, I, so ditto for us. I think uh, we appreciate, on behalf of the industry, I think we appreciate the value of DERS and the opportunity to work with uh, the FCC and the other federal agencies involved. And, uh, we stand ready to continue uh, engaging with uh, with those agencies, most especially the FCC on DERS going forward. So thank you. Um, yeah, I would just echo everyone else. Thank you for, for having us. Uh, we, NAB and broadcasters look forward to working with the FCC to try to further increase participation in DERS. Um, our members appreciate the program a, 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 as valuable as valuable option and um, and uh, you know our broadcasters, our members, we take seriously their role as uh, first informers during times of crisis, and they understand that DERS can be an integral component of keeping them up and on the air to be able to, as, as Mark said, to, to keep people informed and safe. So thank you for having this, and we look forward to future roundtables. Okay. I do want to mention, uh, someone asked if, our, where, if my slides were going to be put online. Actually, there are copies on the, the table over there near the door. So if you want a copy of my slides, you can get them, and we will make sure that anybody who wants copies of my slides can get them. I, I would also like to, um, in closing, I'd like to thank everybody. Uh, I'd, I'd like to thank NCS, but I also would like to particularly thank the companies who provide data, uh, the associations that work with us, but the companies that provide data into DERS, uh, that's what makes DERS work. If, if you guys didn't work with us, didn't, didn't provide the information, we would have no chance of having DERS be a useful system. Um, if you have completely incomplete data, completely inconsistent data, you don't have a useful system. And it's you, you guys' cooperation in, in working with us that really makes a difference. So thank you. And we, I think we can find a way to post your slides so that people who aren't in the room can access them too. Um, John and Charlie, last words? Uh, just last words uh, uh, from, from FEMA is that uh, DERS works. It does work. It, it provides us valuable information. Uh, we appreciate the uh, industri industry partners that are providing the information and hope more get on the bandwagon uh, <laughs> providing the information. Um, as it helps us to help them uh, find out where they where we can provide them assistance in making access easier for them uh, getting getting uh, fuel if necessary to broadcast uh, stations and working with the FCC on that finding out which which broadcast stations may be down etc uh, it's a very good program 
Uh, we've got, a, like I said earlier, we have a very good working relationship with the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau on this, and uh, we hope to continue this relationship uh, in going in. Uh, I would like to add that during the spring tornadoes, uh, DERS and DERS Light was activated fairly rapidly. Uh, it, and those were no notice and and maybe because it happened during the week uh, was uh, was 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 a help on that but uh, our break in and say <coughs> that we did not discuss it today it wasn't the purpose of our roundtable but there is a more informal use of DERS that we call DERS light um, and we'll have Kate will have another discussion about that at some point but, but our, our reach our regional folks that are the first ones that that are the, at the tip of the spear, so to speak, when, when a disaster does happen, uh, they have come to rely on, and one of the first things they request is that DERS gets activated uh, in their regions of responsibility. So it does work, it's a good program, uh, and hopefully, as with anything, it can get better. And uh, we're, we're ready to help the FCC in any way we can. Thanks. John? Th thank you. Um, just to, to wrap up a couple points, I think having these discussions uh, really helps us to have a working relationship there's you know as we said gives you a snapshot but engages you in other conversations um, when we went through Irene there were a number of power restoration prioritization actions that were taken to help the comms industry a medical paging some generators moving uh, please don't re uh, redirect my fuel supply etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and so having these forums make sure that we have a working relationship so we can do some interpretation and also make sure that the infrastructure is up and available to the best of our abilities to deliver services um, regards to down to the states they do get if you will that roll-up summary when we do our, our sit rep reporting so it goes that direction in future i think uh, we may want to look at how we're pushing that out uh, to the states and others um, they are to tell people what sit rep means okay excuse me uh, situation reporting during a, a disaster uh, the NCS is putting together a situation report for the comm status and the actions that are being taken one piece of that is an appendix that would be a roll-up of uh, DERS information um, and that is passed out as part of that product and so it's anonymized and it ties very much into the, the desire of what can we expect as best we can interpret from the data what services available not necessarily what the status of a particular carrier is just the status uh, the ability to have wireline wireless broadcast and others uh, so perhaps we're looking what we're actually telling states and can extract is one of those things that we need to take for future consideration um, a, a second part of that is I think we can tell some stories better from the data that we have so let's look at the analysis of what we have in hand and is there some interpretation that we can derive from that that's going to answer some of the questions and needs that we've put forward here today so I think those are the few things that I uh, we should be looking at as we go forward in our future DERS discussions and what directions we take thank you everyone we appreciate your participation today and we look forward to continuing the conversation about how to um, improve DERS going forward thank you <laughs>